Well, thank you, John, and uh, thank, thank you uh, to all of you for, for coming out today uh, for this lecture. I, I very much appreciate it. Well, uh, China is uh, implementing a well-designed cost-imposing strategy in the Western Pacific that is inexorably undermining the position of the United States and its partners in the region. The U.S. needs a, comp a competitive response if it is to maintain peace and stability in an area the Obama administration has made a top priority for U.S. security planning. Policymakers facing an emerging and perhaps ambiguous threat must make two assessments regarding the potential adversary. First, what mil military capacity might the potential adversary eventually develop? And second, what are the potential adversary's intentions? Is it at least plausible that he, the adversary, could execute courses of action that could put at risk the policymakers' goals and interests. Policymakers are wise to keep their attention focused first on the adversary's future capacity for military action for the simple reason that intentions can change rapidly and unexpectedly. Benign intentions today be can become malign actions tomorrow, but those malign actions only become a problem if the adversary has the military capacity to carry them out. China's intentions of late remain ambiguous but are increasing, increasingly disturbing. Top officials in the Chinese government have repeatedly asserted China's territorial claims over the Senkaku Islands in the East China Seas, which are under Japan's administration. Along with the vast majority of the South China Sea, denoted by China's uh, so-called nine-dash line, or 10-dash line now. Further, China appears to be employing salami slicing Small actions, each of which are calibrated to be too minor to be a casus belli, but which can gradually accumulate over time into substantial geostrategic change. A few recent examples of China's salami slicing in East Asia include China's uh, June 2012 seizure of Scarborough Shoal near uh, the Philippine island of Luzon. The seizure resulted when China immediately defaulted on a deal former Assistant Secretary of State Kirk Campbell believed he had negotiated between China and the Philippines for both sides to simultaneously withdraw their vessels during a dispute over the shoal in the spring of 2012. In the spring of 2014, Chinese and Vietnamese Coast Guard and naval vessels engaged in a standoff involving water cannons and boat collisions after a Chinese oil company temporarily installed a large offshore oil exploration rig inside Vietnam's exclusive economic zone. At 2nd Thomas Shoal uh, in the South China Sea, Chinese paramilitary uh, forces uh, continue a siege of a small garrison of Filipino Marines attempting to maintain possession of the reef. A Chinese major general termed the tactic the cabbage strategy, which he described as the deployment of layers of Chinese civilian enforcement and paramilitary vessels around disputed islands in the South China Sea in an effort to isolate, blockade, and force the withdrawal of non-Chinese residents and garrisons. <clears throat> China's legally dubious air defense identification zone over the East China Sea declared suddenly in November 2013 overlaps with Japan's ADIS and the Senkaku Islands and thus increases the risk of accidents and miscalculation. So policymakers in Washington and in the region seem flummoxed on how to respond to China's salami slicing. Complaints are registered but thus far don't seem to be altering Chinese behavior. China's actions are troubling and raise questions about its future intentions. But what should matter most to U.S. military planners is China's prospective military capacity. And here, China is implementing a well-designed and cost-imposing military modernization program that by next decade will deliver highly effective capabilities to the next generation of Chinese leaders. China's military modernization program began two decades ago after Chinese officials witnessed the technical proficiency displayed by U.S. and allied forces in the 1991 Desert Storm campaign. In addition, the March 1996 Taiwan Straits crisis exposed 
how little capacity China possessed at that time to counter the two aircraft carrier strike groups the United States sent to the region during that crisis. Since then, China's modernization program has made careful use of China's continental position, the revolution in precision missile and sensor technology, and the fact that China's land-based missile forces are not constrained, as is the United States, by the 1987 Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. China has thus been able to develop an effective cost-imposing strategy on the United States. This has forced U.S. military planners into expensive and questionably effective concepts and programs in response to relatively modest investments by the People's Liberation Army. One of China's most significant and enduring competitive advantages is its continental position. China can project its air power over the Western Pacific from dozens of hardened bases on and near its coast. These bases are protected by what the U.S. Defense Department terms one of the most one of the largest forces of advanced surface-to-air missile systems in the world. China has made a substantial investment in variants of the Su-27 flanker strike fighter, roughly equivalent to the U.S. Air Force's F F-15E Strike Eagle. China's flanker variants possess a combat radius of 1,500 kilometers, exceeding the approximately 1,100 kilometer unfueled combat radius of the U.S. Navy's F-35C and uh, F-A-18EF strike fighters. China has produced the J-11B, an indigenous version of the flanker, and the PLA's inventory of flanker variants could number over 400 aircraft by next decade. China's flankers and other strike aircraft, uh, the, uh, in 2014 the U.S. Department estimated that uh, China's inventory of uh, strike fighters, strike aircraft of various kinds uh, will number over 2,100 aircraft. Uh, and they will be armed with a variety of land attack and anti-ship cruise missiles, some with supersonic speed and ranges up to 400 kilometers. By the end of this decade, China is expected to begin forming squadrons of the J-20 strike fighter, a stealthy aircraft with a possible combat radius of up to 2,000 kilometers. According to the U.S. Department of Defense, China possesses up to 1,800 theater-range land-based ballistic and cruise missiles, most of which are mounted on road mobile transporter erector launchers and are thus capable of hiding and relocating in China's complex terrain. The revolution in missile and sensor technology has greatly increased the accuracy of ballistic and cruise missiles and lowered the relative cost of these munitions. Finally, China is assembling a multi-dimensional sensor command and communications network that by next decade should allow it to effectively employ the platforms and munitions in its inventory. It is unsurprising that China is, is exploiting its continental position and the missile and sensor revolution to craft a cost-imposing strategy on the United States in the Western Pacific. In contrast to China's continental position and its wide-ranging missile forces, the United States faces the burden of operating largely as an expeditionary power, which increases its costs and thus makes it harder to compete with the expansion of China's forces. Further, the uh, INF Treaty, the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, prohibits the United States from matching China's comparatively economical land-based theater missile strategy. The U.S. Air Force operates from just six main bases in the theater. The U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission concluded that five of these bases, located in Japan and South Korea, are highly vulnerable to suppression by China's missiles. U.S. Navy and Marine Corps naval and air bases in Japan are similarly vulnerable to attack. Although at a farther distance from Chinese land-based forces, the growing complex of U.S. bases on Guam will become increasingly vulnerable to suppression as China's land attack missiles spread to more platforms, such as China's growing fleet of nuclear attack submarines, and increase in range and numbers. There is increasing concern that U.S. surface warships, including aircraft carrier strike groups, will become vulnerable to multi-axis saturation cruise missile attacks, an operation we should assume Chinese strike fighter regiments and perhaps its submarines should be able to execute before the end of this decade. 
Indeed, the first eight issues of the uh, Naval Institute proceedings in uh, this year, 2014, displayed at least five articles that discussed the growing missile threat to U.S. surface warships. In addition, the recent debate over whether the Navy should require the future unmanned carrier launch surveillance and strike aircraft, called U-Class, to be able to autonomously search for and attack targets at very long range in defended airspace is an acknowledgement that the Navy's carrier strike groups will soon not be able to safely conduct persistent operations inside adversary missile threat zones. The Navy is moving forward on plans to bolster the air and missile defenses of its surface ships, but the economics of the missile and sensor revolution will likely allow China to persist with its cost-imposing strategy. It will be cheaper for China to add more flankers, J-20s, and cheap but smart missiles than it will be for the Navy uh, to add additional ships, radars, and defensive missiles. In the longer run, many are hoping that ship-mounted directed energy weapons will be able to swing the advantage back to missile defense. But according to the Congressional Research Service, reliably de defending against high-end supersonic cruise missiles will require megawatt class free electron lasers which at the earliest won't be available until the second half of the next decade. So salami slicing appears to be working for China and therefore we should expect it to continue. Resisting Chinese, China salami slicing could require a willingness to risk a confrontation involving fishing boats, oil rigs, coast guard vessels, and perhaps military forces. Whether a confrontation results in armed conflict will depend on many factors, most particularly the calculation each side makes regarding its prospects for tactical success. In the past, U.S. policymakers and commanders have been reasonably confident in their tactical superiority, especially in the Western Pacific. But that assumption is now becoming increasingly questionable as China steadily advances its capacity to suppress U.S. bases in the region and threaten U.S. and allied surface warships. Increasing ambiguity, or even worse, both sides assuming they possess escalation dominance is a recipe for disaster during a crisis. Strategists examining the increasingly hazardous security situation in East Asia have proposed direct and indirect responses to China's growing access denial capabilities. The air-sea battle concept represents the direct approach. The concept calls for greater cooperation and coordination among the services to enable U.S. forces to disrupt a high-end adversary's targeting and command networks, destroy an adversary's platforms before they can launch their missiles, and finally defeat enemy missiles before they impact their targets. The U.S. Defense Department's Capstone Joint Operational Access Concept, or JOAC, discusses the risks and barriers U.S. military planners and commanders should address in order to make a direct approach, such as air-sea battle, against adversary access denial forces a feasible course of action. JOAC asserted that it may be technically infeasible or unaffordable to acquire the systems and capabilities required to implement the disrupt, destroy, and defeat lines of effort. In addition, JOAC stated that policymakers may be unwilling to implement some of the lines of effort because they may conclude that the escalation risks attached to them would be unacceptable in particular circumstances. The direct approach also suffers from the fact that it would likely be uncompetitive. In the case of China, it would have the U.S. directing its defense resources against the PLA's main strengths rather than China's vulnerabilities. As one example, the disrupt component attacks against China's targeting and command network would very likely be met by Chinese retaliation against U.S. space-based imagery and communication networks. As the expeditionary player, the U.S. would be the loser from such an exchange because it would, will be cheaper and easier for China, the continental power and the home team, to reestablish terrestrial-based substitutes in place of the lost space-based networks for coverage of a conflict in the East and South China Seas. The indirect approach, featuring a distant blockade and applying economic leverage against China, targets what seems to be a particular Chinese vulnerability and does so in a way that appears to avoid dangerous escalation risks. As a substitute for the direct air-sea battle approach, 
its advocates note that employing U.S. and coalition naval power against China's economy will avoid uncompetitive investments in platforms and support systems designed to attack China's comparative advantages in diversified basing, mobile missiles, and redundant targeting and command systems. However, a blockade strategy suffers from some serious political shortcomings, which likely leave the strategy executed by itself untenable. A blockade against China would be an economic declaration of war by the United States against the global economy, which would include the vast majority of countries that would begin such a conflict as neutral non-belligerents. The United States would thus immediately make enemies of most of these non-belligerents, which would most likely make the strategy unsustainable for very long. In addition, a blockader must anticipate enforcing his blockade for a very long time in order to hold out the prospect of changing an adversary's behavior. It is questionable whether the American public's patience for a strategy that explicitly imposes global economic ruin would run longer than that of an authoritarian and nationalistic China. As U.S. strategists struggled to fashion a response to China's salami slicing and its competitive military modernization, the interim solution will be to, de to, de to, to de uh, display U.S. commitment to the region by deploying even more largely short-range aircraft and surface warships to, an al to already crowded and vulnerable bases in the Western Pacific. Regrettably, this stopgap measure will only further increase crisis instability. For China, the temptation of a disarming first strike during a crisis would rise as the opportunity to destroy even more forward-deployed U.S. platforms presents itself. For U.S. decision-makers, the necessity of attacking China's targeting and command systems first will become even more imperative, <coughs> while the logic of use it or lose it will increasingly apply to U.S. forward-based forces. Thus, paradoxically, deploying even more vulnerable U.S. forces at forward positions will likely only increase danger in the region. If the United States is to maintain the credibility of its alliances in East Asia and freedom in the region's commons, the U.S. and its partners will very likely have to take greater risks resisting China's salami slicing strategy. For that resistance to succeed, the U.S. and its partners will need forces and operational concepts that enhance crisis stability, convince China's leaders that they will not benefit from escalation, and threaten to impose costs on Chinese decision makers in response to actions that place burdens on U.S. and partner interests. As we have seen, there is increasing ambiguity about whether these conditions will exist by next decade. In order to enhance crisis stability, the United States needs to rebalance its portfolio of strike platforms away from vulnerable, and short-range systems forward-based within easy range of China's missile forces. For the U.S. Air Force, that means less investment in tactical fighters and more on bombers and long-range air-to-surface missiles based outside the range of Chinese systems. For the Navy, it will mean reconsidering the centrality of the carrier strike group and revisiting whether a long-term goal of 48 attack submarines will be sufficient if surface forces will struggle to persist inside missile threat zones. The U.S. Army and Marine Corps should play leading roles, bolstering the capabilities of allies and partners, America's most important strategic asset in the region. A greatly expanded security force assistance mission for U.S. ground forces can make progress establishing trust among America's partners, expanding their capacities to collect and share intelligence, build uh, partner conventional access denial military capabilities, and prepare for all forms of irregular and unconventional warfare. The Army and Marine Corps should prepare to execute this critical line of effort. More generally, these steps should be part of a comprehensive approach that assembles political, diplomatic, economic, and conventional and unconventional military techniques into a broad toolbox available to, to U.S. policymakers. China has vulnerabilities, its leaders have anxieties, and the United States and its partners can use such a toolbox to create persuasive and dissuasive leverage that can influence Chinese behavior in mutually beneficial ways. The capacity to impose a distant blockade, along with the capability to 
threaten direct attacks on assets and conditions highly valued by Chinese leaders should be tools in the box. These and other military and non-military tools could be developed to complicate Chinese planning, impose costs during a peacetime competition, and hold at risk Chinese interests in ways that enhance deterrence and sustain regional stability. So China is employing salami slicing and the missile and sensor revolution to execute a cost-imposing strategy on the United States and its partners in the Asia-Pacific region. The United States currently lacks an effective response, but better find one if it is to maintain stability in this vital region. A competitive strategy would greatly expand the security force assistance effort in the region, rebalance U.S. striking power towards long-range air power and submarines, prepare for the full range of irregular and unconventional warfare missions, and assemble a broad portfolio of military and non-military tools that could provide persuasive and dissuasive leverage against China's vulnerabilities. Many of these ideas are controversial and disruptive to established routines, which explains why they haven't generally been implemented thus far. But if the Asia-Pacific region is to maintain the peaceful stability that has benefited all, including China, the United States and its partners will need to steer a new course and soon. Thank you, and now I look forward to uh, answering your questions. Yes. Uh, Matthew Perry, retired Fleet Marine Force. Uh, thank you very much for your time, sir. I have a quick question. Uh, this concept of salami slicing of the atolls and islands around China and their approach to it, how long do you think it will be before China brings its newly acquired uh, naval aviation assets, uh, assets to the equation and how they would use those to protect um, what they're dominating currently? Well, I, th I think that um, China wishes to uh, pursue its salami slicing strategy at, at the lowest uh, um, level possible. In other words, if they can accomplish their salami slicing goals using just their fishing fleet, uh, their police patrol boats, uh, their coast guard vessels, and so forth, uh, that, that's what they would prefer. And, uh, and as, as long as the, um, uh, the, the U.S. and allied response in the region uh, remains uh, befuddled and confused as it is right now, uh, they will be able to, to continue doing it with those sort of uh, low-level, um, non-provocative non uh, sorts of assets. Now, in the longer run, I think uh, that the Chinese strategy is, has two parts to it. First, use the salami slicing technique to, to over a long period of time, a decade or two decades perhaps, uh, grab, gradually ex expand uh, the, the, their uh, perimeter of control there. And then uh, they, use the, they will uh, develop uh, simultaneously their high-end military forces, their land-based uh, uh, air power, uh, anti-maritime forces, missile forces, and so forth to then uh, prevent uh, the U.S. and allied forces from ba being able to subsequently roll back that perimeter. So uh, does that answer your question? I was just uh, curious about how you saw their projection of air power through the use of, of naval aviation with their new aircraft carrier, how that would play yeah. in. But yes. Um, th yes, uh, China is, uh, is developing, uh, it has underway its uh, first aircraft carrier. It's not a fully operational unit yet. Uh, I think that for the, for the Chinese, uh, this aircraft carrier and future aircraft carriers are, are more um, prestige items for them uh, in, in, the short, in the short run because uh, I think they're going to be vulnerable uh, assets uh, to, uh, to U.S. attack, especially from U.S. submarine forces. Uh, I think uh, f from the Chinese perspective, looking down the road, uh, they would like to, maybe in the future, probably maybe 15 years from now, be able to maintain a continuous carrier presence in the uh, Indian Ocean region. Uh, but uh, in terms of um, their uh, access denial uh, strategy for the East and South China Seas, that's mainly going to be uh, based on their land-based missile power. Uh, which it, which is will, is very difficult for the U.S. to attack and suppress. Yes. Uh, just as a little bit of a follow-up on that, the, the latest bit of salami slicing that I'm aware of is the uh, 
really the, the land reclamation at uh, at Fiery Cross Street, such as this this uh, below uh, sea level mm. marker is now larger, twice as large as Uwabu <coughs> is the largest uh, natural island in the South China Sea. So uh, I I would think that this would have implications for air power ultimately. That this is why would they be doing this unless they were to put a, a, a strip on this? Yeah. So the uh, these land reclamation uh, projects. Uh, um, back from in 2002, the, the countries around the South China Sea thought they had an agreement that none of the countries around the South China Sea would uh, engage in land reclamation, uh, and, uh, but uh, China is now doing that at, at, at the location you mentioned and, and a couple of other locations. And the purpose of that is to be able to station a permanent garrison there of some kind. Uh, and, and, and this is all part of salami slicing. If you can establish a, a permanent garrison, uh, then it in, increases the legitimacy of your legal claims uh, to it. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it's, it's all part of the gradual process of, of trying to expand their perimeter there. Yes? Since the pieces of salami are largely not U.S. territory, why does it not make more sense to concentrate on the ability of our so-called partners to resist with aid from us indirectly? Once we get into attacking Chinese, we're now into the big war. But right. they're not, until they take Guam, we're not in that situation. And the, the tactics of, of really getting too closely involved to China seem uh, very risky. Well, I, I agree that uh, that the the, the uh, best course of action. I agree from the implication of your question that the best course of action that the U.S. can take right now is to support its allies and partners in the region. They are the ones that are on the front line uh, of uh, the salami slicing uh, encounters uh, with China, and um, these uh, allies and partners uh, in the region are uh, the U.S. Uh, U.S. best U.S. asset. Um, they, they're small countries, China's a big country, uh, China comes off as a bully uh, during these confrontations uh, and, uh, it, um, and that uh, decreases the leg legitimacy of, of, of China's actions uh, when that is portrayed to the world. So th there, are, there are many things that the U.S. Uh, can be doing to assist uh, the Philippines, uh, Japan, uh, even uh, Vietnam increasingly in the future uh, to improve uh, their maritime presence to match the Chinese presence. Things that can be done with fishing fleets, with Coast Guard vessels, uh, with uh, police patrol vessels and, and so forth uh, to, to match the Chinese presence and, uh, and maybe uh, nip this problem in a bud before it uh, um, grows to be a much larger problem. So I agree with you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And as you go along on this, the one thing that you don't seem to emphasize, and I wonder if you have some reservations about, is our nuclear subsidy and its capabilities as a deterrent. In other words, you're, you're using our, our, our friends and allies and so on, mm -hmm. as you're talking about very well, but the, the subfleet is mobile, it's very protective, and is there, is there a, a downside to that as well? But uh, in other words, that, I would think that, that would be pretty scary if things get out of hand, that if you have a large submarine fleet uh, that's capable of raising devastation really on the uh, Chinese country, uh, I would think that that would be a, a good deterrent that's not in everybody's face, it's just out there. Yes, uh, I, I agree that, uh, that the uh, uh, plans for uh, the future of uh, the U.S. attack submarine fleet are, are too small. Uh, the end state is uh, for 48 attack submarines in the 2020s and 2030 time frame. Uh, that's too few in my opinion, especially if uh, the U.S. surface ships are not going to be able to operate freely in a crisis inside uh, these missile range fans. So yes, the, I, I propose uh, in my book and I m mention it in my speech and elsewhere that, uh, that I, I think money should should be shifted from uh, surface warships towards uh, submarines of all kinds, uh, both the, the large hull and the attack sub, uh, Virginia class hull, and uh, uh, and that really uh, hold the uh, Chinese uh, Navy at risk that way. 
yes, in the middle there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, you mentioned this one of the asymmetries between China and the United States is that China is not constrained by the IRBM Treaty of 1987. Correct. Um, how, how, in your opinion, might the U.S. be constrained by that treaty vis-a-vis -vis China? What difference does it make vis-a-vis -vis China that we're constrained by the IRBM Treaty? Well, uh, it, uh, the, uh, the United States, uh, in, under the uh, Intermediate, in, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty of uh, 1987, it was uh, signed uh, by President Reagan and uh, President Gorbachev, uh, eliminated a whole class of uh, land-based uh, theater range uh, nuclear missiles, both cruise missiles and uh, ballistic missiles with ranges between 500 kilometers to 5,500 kilometers. Missiles, not cruise missiles. No, the cruise missiles were land-based cruise missiles were, were eliminated by the treaty. Uh, Sea-based and air-based missiles are, are, are still permitted. Uh, so uh, China is not a party to the treaty, only now Russia and the United States, the treaty is still in force. So uh, this precludes the United States uh, from uh, having any uh, deployment or development of land-based ballistic or cruise missiles with ranges between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. Now, this would be a, now China is completely unconstrained in this regard, and it's a, a major, major part of uh, China's military modernization program, the, the build-out of its uh, land attack and uh, anti-ship uh, cruise missiles of theater range uh, anywhere from uh, 100 kilometers range to uh, 10,000 kilometers and everything in between. Uh, and the U.S. Department of Defense in their annual reports on Chinese military power say that the Chinese missile program is the most active missile program in the world. So the, the U.S. is prohibited from competing here at all uh, in this space. And what, what we well, the, the uh, advantage for the United States would be that uh, it would be a very uh, inexpensive uh, way for us to uh, uh, match uh, Chinese missile power because the, it's uh, it'd be much cheaper to to deploy 100 or 500 uh, land-based uh, missiles in the region on transporter erector launchers than it is to build fle fleets of bombers or or uh, fleets of, uh, of of attack submarines. Well, uh, you could you could put them in. Uh, in, in Japan, on Okinawa, you could put them on in the Philippines, uh, uh, or or elsewhere. Uh, they would they would provide a, a, a deterrent to attack uh, and a better deterrent to attack than the, the vulnerable fixed bases are uh, right now in the region. Yes. There's uh, significant disunity, or at least uh, you read periodically, a lot of disunity amongst the factions or the sectors of the Chinese government, for example, the political end, the economic uh, considerations, and military. Uh, how does that, um, how does that, uh, uh, it, it, it get included in the strategic thinking and the strategic planning? Is it, it would seem like a, there could be a divide in fact, divide and conquer concept uh, in, in the context of, of uh, not a, of a Cold War or a, or a not a hot situation. Well, I agree with you completely. Uh, as I mentioned in, in my speech and I explore in, in my book, uh, China has uh, vulnerabilities, anxieties, uh, things that it fears uh, internally. Uh, there are uh, factions uh, inside uh, the government that uh, uh, debate uh, where China should be going and what, is, what its uh, strategy should be, what its external policy should be. So uh, these uh, factors that you mentioned should be a greater part of uh, U.S. Uh, analysis uh, and uh, should play a bigger part in the formulation of our strategy. And, and uh, as I discussed, uh, the U.S. needs a, a broad portfolio of uh, tools, uh, military and non-military, to be able to put uh, pressure uh, on these uh, Chinese vulnerabilities in order to um, be able to influence Chinese peacetime behavior and prevent uh, conflict from happening in the first place. 
there are countries that we would not normally be associated with. I'm thinking that in particular Russia and Vietnam, who have conflicts in the area with with uh, with China. Is anything? Are, are we the only one that's making a major effort to counteract, or are these countries, which are traditionally China's enemies, um, are, are they making any concerted effort or any unified effort? And a second follow up to that, with the constraints, certainly Korea, uh, the Philippines don't have the same constraint on tactical missiles that we do. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any effort being made to develop them there? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the first part of your question is, yes, these uh, countries that, that uh, are, neighbor, are China's neighbors and, and are on the front line of uh, China's uh, assertions uh, now are, are very concerned uh, about Chinese behavior and they are responding to it. Uh, Chinese um, or uh, non-Chinese military spending in the region is expected to uh, go up 50 percent in the next five years. So and we're talking about increases in the defense budgets of in uh, uh, Japan, Australia, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and so forth. This is a response to uh, Chinese activity in the South China Sea, East China Sea. So yes, they are responding. Uh, on the other hand, they have a lot of ani they have animosities, historical animosities with each other, as we see in the case of Japan and Korea, uh, and other countries all around the region. They have their animosities, so they are not cooperating with each other as well as they should. Uh, they uh, ideally they would look to the United States to be a, the glue that would hold together uh, uh, some semblance of uh, coordinated activity in a, in a better fashion. So. This is why I mentioned uh, that our uh, diplomacy and political side of our response in the region is a critical part, and, uh, and there's more we can be doing in that to, to make that a more effective line of effort. Yes? Is China part of the uh, group that the treaty includes? You signed that? The Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty? No, it's just the United States and Russia. Why don't we change it? Well, we... we, we we could we could ask uh, ask China to uh, to voluntarily become a signatory, but uh, I don't hold out much prospect for that uh, actually to occur, because it's uh, such a central part of their military modernization program and a competitive advantage for them. If we don't have an agreement with them. Why do we have to abide by our agreement? Well, the treat the treaty is uh, is. Uh, it's from ni 1987 between the United States and well. The, uh, this this could be a, an issue that uh, comes up in the future, but could be sooner than later. Right. A couple of questions uh, for you. Um, the Japanese government is currently embarked on a fairly major uh, enhancing of its uh, military, uh, particularly the Navy and Air Force. Do you see that as being developed as a purely balanced force aligned to Japanese operate independently if they have to? with China in mind and Russia? Or are they doing that in conjunction with assuming the U.S. will be providing part of whatever force they're trying to provide? Are they, so are they doing it independently to act alone? Or, mm -hmm. And then the second question, we're all, of course focused on China, but as the uh, other gentleman brought up the Russians, uh, obviously they've been on the move fairly significantly in the last couple of years. Do we see in uh, light of Astok and elsewhere in the Russia-Pacific side, any similar increase, or is that uh, of military, or is that mostly on the uh, European side? Well, it, to, the answer to your first question is, is uh, uh, at this point it would be, I think, sort of unthinkable for Japan to, to um, contemplate uh, independent uh, military operations uh, uh, out, outside without the United States as a partner, but uh, Will they hedge? Will they? Do they? Might they see the need for some type of hedging strategy uh, in the future? Uh, I think that would uh, depend upon their uh, judgments about uh, the future uh, U.S. external policy in, in the region. So not yet, uh, but uh, we'll have to see how that develops. Uh, with respect to, uh, and let me one last thing on on the Japanese point. Right now. Uh, 
we see uh, the uh, interaction and interoperability between the United States uh, and Japan increasing, uh, more exercises together uh, involving uh, higher level capabilities and so forth. So that's, that's the current trend. Um, with respect to uh, Russia, uh, Russia does seem to be uh, increasing uh, some of its uh, military activities in the region, at least in the aviation area. They've uh, done, done the, these long-time maritime, long-range maritime patrol operations, uh, flying their uh, 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 maritime reconnaissance strike aircraft around Guam and so forth. Uh, but in terms of the magnitude, uh, it's uh, not up to uh, what uh, the, the, uh, the situation posed by China is right now. China, China is the much larger uh, concern at the moment. Yes, sir. You have not yet discussed Chinese merchant shipping. It seems to me merchant shipping is the centerpiece of any country's maritime power. Maybe you could compare what they're shipping now. Well, China's, uh, in terms of its uh, industrial capacity, its, its ability to, to build uh, ships, ships of, uh, of all kinds, including uh, maritime uh, commercial uh, ships uh, at competitive prices, uh, is, a, is a, uh, a hallmark of uh, their economy. And uh, uh, we, just, it's a, we see an increasing presence uh, of, uh, of uh, Chinese maritime power, uh, military and non-military uh, across the board, uh, and increasing presence in, in ports all, all over the world. And this is a reflection of uh, the uh, changed trajectory of the, uh, of the Chinese economy that's occurred over the past three decades. Um, Deng Xiaoping, uh, the paramount leader, came into office in 1979 and uh, uh, adopted a new uh, economic policy for China, which opened up the Chinese economy uh, to the world, to world trade. Uh, previous to that, un under Mao, uh, China, Chinese economy had been mostly closed to the world. Now, uh, the consequence of that over the past 30 years has first been a tremendous growth in uh, Chinese uh, economic capacity, and but second is the tremendous um, uh, growth in uh, China's uh, uh, imports of raw materials from all over the world and Chinese exports of finished goods uh, all over the world. And, uh, that, and uh, along with that uh, comes the, the need for uh, Chinese merchant shipping uh, and now the expansion of Chinese uh, military naval power uh, to protect Chinese interests around the world. So, so it, all, it all ties together in the, in the bigger story uh, that we've seen over the past 30 years. Well, suppose uh, the Chinese just decided, well, we won't ship, we won't carry American cargo, inbound or outbound. Where would we be? We don't have, have very much shipping of our own. Well, uh, one thing that uh, the U.S. policymakers and the US, U.S. public have to uh, grapple with uh, as, a, as a general matter uh, is this um, duality of China being a, a strategic competitor uh, on the one hand and, all, and China simultaneously being a, a very significant uh, trade partner, financial partner. Uh, the U.S. Uh, hasn't encountered uh, such a strange relationship uh, for 200 years. It's, uh, it was in the War of 1812 when we last uh, had a conflict with a country that was simultaneously uh, a strategic competitor, Great Britain at that time, and also uh, our most important uh, commercial and financial partner. Uh, it created uh, political divisions inside the United States over, over what war policy should be uh, during the War of 1812. And uh, now we see uh, this, uh, the United St U.S. policymakers and the public are going to have to grapple with the same duality uh, in, uh, with this uh, current circumstance. Yes, in the back. With the, uh, the broad spectrum activities of uh, the Chinese in the region, it would seem that that's forcing the U.S. and, and allies in, in the area to uh, carefully select the battles they want to fight. 
Uh, so the question that I have is, uh, is, is this really uh, go poorly for Taiwan in terms of uh, the support that, that the Taiwanese government currently gets? Are they likely uh, to be a bargaining chip that, and, and a battle that we, uh, mm -hmm. that we choose not to, to fight in a way that we have in the past? Well, the, the Taiwan issue is, uh, has to be perhaps the most uh, delicate, uh, sensitive, raw uh, issue uh, in uh, U.S.-China relations in terms of the strategic situation in, uh, in, in, the, in East Asia and the Western Pacific. Uh, and it's, 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 um, it's the uh, one issue that is, uh, guarantees uh, flare-ups. Uh, bad flare-ups in the U.S.-China relationship and it's and pre presidents uh, uh, ever since um, uh, Truman and Eisenhower all the way up to the present uh, have had to to, to deal with uh, the sensitivity of the Taiwan issue. Now uh, uh, Taiwan has to has to fashion uh, for itself uh, what it's um, uh, a good defense strategy uh, that seems to be an issue that's in flux uh, for the Taiwanese uh, leadership right now, what, what their defense strategy should be. They're making um, pretty substantial changes in, in the structure of their armed forces and trying to figure out a good approach, uh, a workable, sustainable approach uh, to defend Taiwan. Uh, the U.S., so under U.S. domestic law, has this uh, obligation under the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act to su support Taiwanese defense, but uh, every time we, uh, every time U.S. presidents uh, approach that issue, it in, in, in inevitably results in a flare-up with uh, Beijing. Uh, so uh, it's it's going to be an ongoing issue, and uh, and I can say from a from a, mili from a military perspective, um, the one thing that. Um, uh, U.S. military strategists uh, would not want to see our um, uh, PLA bases on the east side of uh, Taiwan uh, because that would break up the first island chain, uh, ease, make it much easier for the PLA uh, Navy and Air Force to access the Western Pacific. Um, whether uh, that will always be the case uh, may be something that uh, is not in uh, American hands. Yes. Could, could we be brought into war because one of our allies on that treaty uh, created the war? Well, this is uh, another um, uh, delicate matter, uh, uh, among many delicate matters, uh, regarding diplomacy, politics, and strategy in, in East Asia. Uh, regarding these, uh, these disputed claims uh, in the East China Sea, South China Sea, the official position of the U.S. government is uh, basically neutrality. Uh, we don't take sides uh, over these uh, disputed claims, over these rock shoals, islands, and so forth. Uh, we just don't want, but we also say we don't want any of these disputes resolved by, through coercion or force. Uh, so the point of that policy is to um, uh, allow the United States to not get uh, dragged in uh, to a, a small country's uh, uh, war, uh, but uh, as China's salami slicing continues and the pressure continues, uh, I think it's go there's going to be forces placed on uh, the next generation of U.S. policymakers to uh, evaluate whether this uh, declaration of neutrality over these disputes uh, will be uh, continue to be a tenable policy. You've addressed some of, the inter some of the political constraints that we have. What, if any, internal constraints to this expansionist policy does China have? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, uh, China, it's, in terms of its diplomatic position in the region, is almost the mirror image of the United States. The United States has lots of friends and allies. It's our biggest uh, asset there. Uh, these countries want uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, to uh, provide the glue 
uh, for a better security system in the region. China, by contrast, has almost no friends in the region. And, uh, and its behavior uh, of late, since around 2008 and thereafter, is, as, as it becomes ever more uh, belligerent uh, and assertive, it's uh, creating a backlash and a response uh, by the other countries in the, in the region. And that's, that's to our benefit. So Chinese uh, external policy uh, hasn't been as subtle as it uh, could have been over the past five, six years. And, uh, and that's, that's been to our benefit, I think, in terms of uh, stimulating a response among, among our allies. What's your thoughts on the future prognosis of laser technology, both offensively and defensively? Well, for, for the Navy, uh, laser or directed energy weapons, uh, as they're known, uh, the, Na the Navy is uh, placing high hopes uh, in directed energy uh, to uh, provide a, a better um, defense against a missile attack than what they have right now. And uh, uh, so this is, a, this is a, an area that's getting a lot of investment, a lot of uh, research talent uh, is going into it, uh, and uh, a lot of experimentation. Um, I think uh, the problem for the Navy is that um, the arrival of uh, such a technology, firstly, is, is, is uh, ambiguous or it's a little bit in doubt right now. And second, it, its arrival may come uh, after, a, uh, after we have to get through some window of vulnerability. So as I mentioned, uh, the high-end th uh, th threat against surface uh, warships are, are, are these supersonic, long-range, uh, highly precise uh, anti-ship cruise missiles that can be launched from, a, from aircraft, submarines, other surface ships, uh, shore batteries, and so forth. Uh, and they can be massed in, into these uh, saturation attacks, 100 missiles, 200 missiles uh, coming at a, at a carrier strike group. Um, now, uh, scientists have held out the hope that, uh, that uh, a free electron laser uh, with a powered it with a megawatt or more of energy uh, could uh, provide um, uh, a, a, a more reliable response to, to, to such a cruise missile saturation attack. But according to the um, Congressional Research Service, the earliest we could expect uh, something like that arriving in the fleet would be after 2025. So we have a, a decade to get through uh, of, a, of a dangerous period here. Yes, in the back. Is there, is there any danger in, in your opinion with the, the Japanese now uh, developing a stronger and more independent uh, military and particularly the Navy uh, regarding re reawakening uh, old Chinese memories? Well, I think they're already awake. Okay. Uh, as they are in uh, in Korea, uh, also. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, uh, some other countries who have had uh, bad experiences with uh, Japan, uh, such as uh, in, in historical memory, I'm talking about uh, the Philippines, uh, Viet and Vietnam. Um, they are uh, welcoming, and Australia too. Uh, they are welcoming. Uh, um, the uh, slight reemergence of uh, of the Japanese military, uh, the, the, uh, the Japanese um, government uh, recently changed its policy on uh, weapons exports. They tr they had been banned heretofore, but now uh, under new government policy, uh, Japanese um, uh, uh, military suppliers like Mitsubishi and others. Uh, now can, are, are allowed to export their, wep, uh, their systems, military systems. And so this means uh, that, that uh, Japan and Australia just uh, recently entered into an agreement uh, to uh, for, uh, uh, for, for Japan to uh, supply a replacement uh, to the uh, Australian submarine fleet, uh, which is a, a huge development. Uh, there's more military assistance occurring between um, Japan and the Philippines, between uh, Japan and Vietnam. So 
Uh, it depends on the depends on the country. All of them have bad memories of uh, the the Japanese colonial era, but some of them, which maybe feel like they're the most under threat from um, from China, especially around the South China Sea, uh, are maybe taking a little more realistic uh, look at this. Any other questions? Yes. I think you used the word "bumbling" to describe our policies in that region. Uh, China's policy, actually, China's foreign policy, okay. a little, little bumbling. Uh, I mean, they're a bull in the China shop, and it's uh, lately, and it's it's caused a little bit of a backlash. Uh, so that's what I meant to say. Yes. Uh, if, if there's an aerial engagement and actually shots fired as a result of China's extension of its ADIS over the Senkaku Islands. So if there's actually shots fired between China and Japan over the Senkaku Islands, does that trigger our treaty obligation to Japan in, in accordance with our mutual defense treaty? Well, I will, uh, I will take uh, President Obama at his word. Uh, I, a, 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 a few a few months ago, uh, he was on a state visit uh, to uh, Japan and uh, stood there with the uh, Japanese Prime Minister and said, uh, uh, "Our mutual defense treaty uh, covers uh, the Senkaku Islands since they're under Japanese administration, and that's uh, been long-standing U.S. policy, a continuation of policy under all previous administrations." So, so. Uh, how, how uh, U.S. Pacific Command w will actually uh, handle such a, such a situation, we'll have to wait and see, but uh, at least it's the express policy uh, from the highest level of our government. The mutual, mutual defense treaty territorially applies only to the territory of Japan. Uh, so attacks on the United States don't trigger it. Attacks on Japanese ships in international waters wouldn't trigger it. And the Senkaku mm -hmm. Islands are disputed territory. Yes, but uh, as I mentioned, the uh, pres President of the United States, the Secretary of, Def of State, the Secretary of Defense, they've all said explicitly uh, that, that the Senkakus, they're under Japanese administration, and so, for so therefore they fall under the uh, Mutual Defense Treaty. Yes? Last question. Do you feel that the lack of U.S. political pressure on China and these salami slicing matters do you think that it's an appeasement tactic for their cooperation in putting pressure on North Korea? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I think I think that uh, um, the uh, the policy, and it's been a bipartisan policy uh, uh, towards uh, towards uh, China, has been uh, what I call forbearance. Uh, in other words. Um, uh, hoping and expecting that uh, China will become a responsible stakeholder in the international community and uh, to avoid uh, the, the so-called Thucydides trap or sort of a rush to conflict. Uh, now I, I think that uh, there's an expiration date approaching on this uh, forbearance policy because it's not working out uh, the way uh, policymakers from both parties in the United States had hoped. Uh, uh, so I don't really think it's related to uh, to uh, the North Korea situation. Well, thank you very much for your questions.